You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. What's up, guys? Welcome into Good Morning Lambo. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. You can email us, Packers Total Access at gmail.com. You can text us, 865-658-5824. I'm joined alongside Tim, live in Green Bay. Uh, hope you guys are having an awesome Wednesday morning here as you're getting the uh, the day going. This is hump day, Tim. This is hump day. Getting ready to come uh, – Come right down the uh, the other side of the week, and we've got football coming up on Saturday. Meaningful football for the Packers, as we got two division rivals that are going to be playing, and then of course we've got the Packers kicking off Sunday against Tampa. Who Tampa's one of those teams, Tim? It, you look one second and you go, man, they're putting up you know a lot of points, and then the next second it's like, all right, they're dookie. You don't really know what you're going to get. Much like the Giants game, um, it's just one of those games you could go in not knowing what to expect, you know, uh, the volatility, I guess you could say, with some of these teams who have quarterbacks who are unproven, but at the same time, there's not a whole lot of tape on them. I think you've seen that with uh, who I'm going to continue to refer to as Danny DeVito because I cannot remember Tommy DeVito. So uh, I know that Tommy Cutlass is the other one. But anyway, how's your morning going, pal? Going well. We've got the diesel going, man. I, I'm on uh, – got one cup down already. I'm waiting for cup two. It's <laughs> same, man, same. I just finished cup one of that – Get it in you first thing in the morning, man. Especially when you're out there farming like AJ Dillon. I'm not going to hit it that early, though. Okay, I'm not going to hit that early. Um, all right, yeah, we got everybody in the chat. Mark in here, Carly Ray, Zane, Derek K, Sam up in the house, Nick McSwain, Omer, of course. Got the whole crew in here. Appreciate y'all swinging through. Um, let's do this. Let's hit on a couple of the comments here. First, uh, first of all, Omer in the chat says Dontavian Wicks is likely out two to three weeks with a high ankle sprain. Jaden Reed is in concussion protocol. We'll see what other news we get today. Matt not having anything to say yesterday. Um, yeah, you know, holding out a little bit of hope for Jaden Reed. We'll see, right? It's just one of those things, too, that that was a lick. Tim, did you get to go back and watch him take that hit on that two-point that, that two point conversion, man? Have you seen it again or not? Yeah, yeah. Bro, he it was like he cut the corner and seen everything break down and was just like, here we go, let's try. Bang. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, he came out the other side. I thought he was in the pile. And then as as the play ended, it's like he disappeared into the pile. And then as everybody got up, he was on the ground a couple yards back, and he was just laying there motionless like. Now, you talk about a kid willing to sacrifice his body. I can't talk about it enough. That stuff, that means a lot to me as a fan when you see someone willing to sacrifice their body like that. Um, Jaden Reed's going to be a good one. But I say all that because we pointed to earlier in the year, you know, Quay, uh, Quay Walker got a, got a concussion. And obviously, he ended up playing that that very next week, right? He cleared concussion protocol pretty uh, pretty quickly. So hopefully, we'll get some good news from Jaden. If he's out today, what we're looking for is a limited participation. Once he goes limited, that means he's moved to the next step of concussion protocol, and you're on track. It's very rare someone gets to that point where they're limited because they're so cautious about it, and then they don't play the uh, the very next game. So if he's if he's not limited by you know, practice on Friday, Tim, I, I feel comfortable saying, okay, he's out, you know? Yeah, I agree. And, you know, the only thing that is, a, you know, gives you a little concern with this is we are on a short week. Um, so it, turnaround time might be that much more difficult um, because these are, you know, concussion is one of those things that it's like time, you know, you can't really fight time. Time is what they're looking at and your, your progression as you go through the protocol. So yeah, we'll keep an eye on the injury report. Uh, clearly, 
you know, we need him. <laughs> we need, we need Mr. Reed out there. Um, next man up mentality, of course, but, uh, y- you want Jaden Reed out there, uh, especially with, um, you know, Scoot kind of being, the the question mark here, uh, with his, uh, injuries as well. So, uh, and then Tay Wicks with the high ankle sprain, you know, that's going to be a, a handful of games there, um, without him. So, uh, yeah, hopefully Jaden Reed is good to go, but also, you know, if he's not, he's not guys that there's a reason we have these protocols. So hopefully he's okay. And, uh, gets through this for sure. Definitely. Lorenzo Delgado, one of the coolest names in the chat, says, good morning. I appreciate you swinging through, hanging out with with us here on this uh, beautiful Wednesday morning. You know, I'm kind of keeping my eye. I don't mean to be rude, Tim, when you're talking. I'm trying to keep my eye on uh, NFL Network over there. There's owners meetings today, and they're talking about health and safety stuff, obviously, as they always are. Here we are talking about a concussion for the Packers. You know, they're talking about those, those injuries and monitoring them all through the season. Uh, One of the other talking points, too, I haven't heard any definitive answer yet, but there was some stuff that came out on the new salary cap. We'll hit on real, real briefly here. Uh, Let's see if I can find the screen grab. Ian tweeted this out the other day. Ian Rappaport, of course, at Rap Sheet on Twitter, said the NFL Management Council informed clubs that it won't provide a salary cap projection this week, but business is booming and the cap could exceed $240 million when set. So sounds like the cap. Reading into that a little bit, the cap's going to be even higher than they expected. And I'm thinking that at these owner meetings, we should know something here within the next day or two um, if it hasn't already been reported. So if you guys have heard that, post it in the chat there, and we'll get the information to everyone who's listening on the pod as well. But uh, just uh, kind of keeping an eye on that. You know, you guys know where I stand on the salary cap. I'm not one of these people that says the salary cap is fake. I'm also not one that tries to pretend like you've got to balance the books and stay. It's like, it's, there's so many loopholes. The, the salary cap is very real in my opinion, from a, uh, uh, from a deadline standpoint, from a date standpoint, it's very date sensitive, if you will. That's why you find yourself having to get rid of a Zadarius Smith because you couldn't get the cap number worked out before you hit the deadline. Therefore, okay, we got to move on. We got to cut you. Um, But you know, from that perspective, I'm not saying you can go out and just spend an infinity amount of money. I mean, look at the Saints. Everyone immediately, when I bring up the Saints, they go, but yeah, look how bad they are. That's not the point. They've made bad decisions on their personnel. They went out and got the quarterback they wanted to get. That's the point. They made the bad decision on the quarterback. There's no two ways about it. Still a lot of good players on that team. Obviously, they went down to the wire with the Packers there earlier in the year. But I remember when we played them too, Tim, everybody's talking about how good that defense is. The point is, they're like next year, they're like 80 million over the cap. And they go, Oh, I caught up with them. No, it's been like that the last three years, and they always get under the cap. So you can stretch a window out for an extent an extended period of time. Now, I am one people hear that and they might get deterred and go, I don't like that. I agree. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish you couldn't push cap out like that. I wish it was just very cut and dry. I was telling Tim, I talk, talk about all the time. My personality types a logistician. I want the books balanced yesterday. You know what I'm saying? Like um that that type of stuff. It really uh, it irks me, but when that's the game you're playing, cash over cap. You, if you don't play the game, you're going to fall behind. There's no no two ways about it. You got anything to say on the salary cap, Tim, or anything looking forward, or maybe how the Packers have handled the salary cap in the past? The the more I learn about it, the less I understand. So no, not <laughs> I think it's all of us. <laughs> not a lot of input on the cap, um, other than uh, it'd be real interesting to see what happens with Bakhtiari. <laughs> That's yeah. about it. That's right, my thoughts right. on it. Keep David Bakhtiari watch. Um, but no, uh, and it doesn't surprise me that there's no cap update. I mean, that's seems like business as usual. They're literally kicking the can down the road right. with kicking the can down the road. So it's um, almost like they're following our government's lead. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's a future problem. We'll figure that out later. Yeah. We'll let our grandchildren handle that. That's no, right. My, uh, my, anyway, here we are already talking about how messed up our our two-party system is. <laughs> Nick McSwain in the chat says, Hey, Clayton, question. Seemed like edge rushers were getting pressure, but DeVito had a huge lane to escape through. Uh, just curious how exactly that happened. Um, I, think, I think the answer to that question, Nick, is in another question. When has anyone else done that this year? Can't think of one time other than, like we mentioned, Justin Fields, which he – He'll tuck even when there isn't a, th- a running lane. He'll tuck that thing and run. Like he he's got the athleticism to be the the fastest player on the field at any time. Like much like Mike Vick back in the day, and he's kind of on pace to be a better rushing quarterback than Mike Vick. Thank God he can't throw the ball. But as a Packer fan, of course, 
Um, some Bears fans that listen to this go, what do you what do you mean, thank God? What are you trying to say? You know exactly what I'm trying to say. And it looked like they're coming around too, judging by Twitter, but that's a story for a different day. Um, so to answer your question, on tape, as they go into that game, you could tell Brian Dayball there was emphasis on look. The, they've got a great pass rush, and all week long, everyone talked about how we're going to get five sacks, we're going to get seven sacks. We might sack them 20 times. They're the most, you know, they give up the most sacks in the league. I guarantee you what Dayball went in with that game plan was, listen, Tommy, Tommy Cutlets, listen to me, Danny. Um, they're going to rush upfield. Their tackles, I feel like they played it like we're going to give you the outside. And all day long, the game plan is going to be for DeVito to step up in the pocket, right? So now people go, well, that's Joe Barry's fault. I disagree. As an edge rusher, especially your most veteran, if you were to look at every position on this team and say, who's got the most experience, I guarantee you, you would say the edge room's got to be the most experienced aspect of this team. They've got to be willing to adjust. they got to be willing to adapt to that. So uh, I've actually got a quick video on a Tommy, uh, Tommy DeVito uh, pass here. I wasn't going to hit it right off the bat, but I'll post it here or we'll show it. This is actually Brian Baldinger breaking down that touchdown pass he made. Um, the thing I want, the thing I keyed in on, as soon as the guy caught the caught the touchdown in the corner of the end zone, Tim, I immediately thought, absolutely perfect throw from Devito. But also, I, I wanted to get mad, like why why are you giving him the corner like that? And I go, it's a seventh round rookie, man. I don't know. I know Rasul doesn't play on the right, but I'm just saying, like we uh, we didn't put an emphasis on this. And you're going to see it. It's going to rear its ugly head throughout the season. There's no two ways about it. This is one of those situations. But let's watch this play real quick and hear Brian Baldinger, 11-year vet in the NFL, one of the best at breaking down the tape. You guys should follow him on Twitter. You can get this video for free on Twitter. Um, he uh, he shared it, uh, I think it was yesterday, but here we go. You're building a resume reel for Tommy DeVito. This play has to be on it. Giants motion from a three-by-one to a – I didn't focus on this, guys. But let's focus on the edge defender on the right side here, okay? That would be Rashawn Gary down at the bottom, okay? Let's see what he does here to kind of answer um, whoever it was a, a question there in the chat. Two by two, that's Isaiah Hodgins. And right here, third and seven, 14-13 game play action. DeVito's first look is up at the top to the two-man side. I'm going to stop for a second. Look at Rashawn Gary. He played this play different, didn't he? He didn't rush upfield. He stopped and he's looking to contain that inside rush lane. So watch what DeVito does now. Third and seven. Doesn't look like there's seven yards right there. So he's come back to the other side. And now what the great ones do, they extend the play and they make dime type throws. Like, let's just watch it here and just enjoy it together because this is a big time play. Play action, feet set, ready to throw, not there. Third and seven, you're scoring touchdowns or you're kicking field goals. All right, this throw right here, he's looking back, running, and on the run, you make this throw against the rookie Valentine to Hodgins. Like, you can't throw it any better. And he gives him time to get the feet down, toe-tap drag, Giants up 21-13. Huge play. So to answer the question there, I can't remember. I've already taken it off the screen and unmarked it. I apologize. Whoever it was that asked the question, thank you for asking that. Um, on that play specifically there, you've seen Rashawn Gary. He, he adjusted, Tim. He, instead of rushing outside, he literally stops, takes the inside rush lane away. And if you look on the other side, I'm going to put it up. If you're building. Watch uh, – if you'll watch uh, Devondre Campbell here, there's a better angle. Campbell's spying here, right? They're playing zone. They're playing – they love playing this country quarter's uh, spot drop inside the 10. That's why their red zone defense is so good most of the time. But look at Dre right here. It's not really a spot. It's not really a spy, but look, he's on him too, right? Just a perfect throw. Absolutely perfect throw. Yeah, and I got to be honest. I'd like to see Dre fire – a little bit sooner, sooner and take yeah. take an angle and come come downhill at, at that quarterback rather than uh I don't know yeah. what what that was. Yeah the problem is you know he is he's thinking his zone too right there may be some somebody kind of somebody coming behind him. him yeah but you're right that's I'm 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 not saying that as an excuse I'm saying that's the only reason he would have any any reason to uh right and like you're saying he's not all out in spy mode I mean, if he wasn't a spy, then maybe he he is. As soon as Devito rolls out, he's gonna he's gonna keyhole on him. But yeah. you know, you're you're kind of being a spy, but you're all, right. You're like you said, you have zone zone principles you have to worry about there. Um, and then Valentine, what do you what can you say? Um, turn your head, kid, and look for the ball at some point. I mean, you yeah. already gave up the leverage, and, and you got him running to the corner. I mean, I gotta think if he if he can get his head around and glance, maybe we get a PBU there. But um, you know, he was beat, but 
I guess the one positive there is he wasn't, you know, like wide open. You know, he was beat by a good step, step and a half. Right. That's correctable, right? You know, he's going to see that in the film room. He knows he knows what he did there. Yeah. It's a learning moment. And, um, yeah, a great play by uh, the Italian stallion there, right? You know, what are you, what are <laughs> you going to do? You know, we finally make an adjustment, and then DeVito makes an adjustment. You know, it, it is what it is. We got outplayed. That's that's what happened. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, the kid had himself a game. Good for him. Yeah. And Lorenzo Delgado in the chat said, Barry should have caught a spy on third downs. He did. Not all not. Not all not. And I think if he had of, uh, there would have been more passing yards. Um, that's the thing you've seen on the final drive, too. We run a cover one spy. Cover one man spy And what happened. He picked them apart. You know why? Because you've got one less guy in coverage, one less guy rushing. He's literally one-on-one -on -one with the quarterback. He has no other assignment. It makes you weaker in other spots. I'm not defending that call. I'm not saying he should have done it more. I'm not saying he should have done it less. It's just the understanding is no matter what the call is, there's a positive effect and a negative effect to every call you make on the football field. It's 11 on 11. And yep. when you do something to – specifically try to take one thing away, you're removing a spot from another aspect of your defense or your offense. You know, you leave a tight end in the chip block because the pass rush is getting after you. You have one less target in the passing game. Therefore, they're going to gain one more plus one hat count in the secondary. It's going to be harder to fit that ball in there. Um, it's just – it's the things I love about football. And uh, I always try to acknowledge that because um, it really is a simple game but a complex game. It really is about trying to find that plus one. That's that's how Nick Saban's had so much success in Bama is his tri triangle and box defense. He he plays a lot of what they call cover six, and it's zone match principles. It's too high shell, much like the Fangio system, with zone match principles. And it's really, really simple. Always stay plus one. If there's three receivers on one side, you'll play box, right, which is basically four defenders over top, and you box them in. If there's two receivers, if you're in a two-by-two two set, you play what we call triangle, three defenders, and you're going to triangle them in to that zone covering that ground. Um, that's And depending on what the offense runs determines if and then, you know, like Haddad said, if and then. If they do this, then we do that. But you always stay plus one in the hat count and get after the quarterback with a four-man rush. Um, I think it was in the game plan, whoever made that comment, to, hey, look, these guys like to just pin their ears back and rush. Let's make them pay for it. And they did. They did. There's no no doubt about it. Yep. So, uh, But as far as the spy, Barry did call a spy. Should he have called it every every play? Possibly, right? But, uh, yeah, there you go. That's kind of how I see it. So, anyway, um, let's move on to the next comment here real quick, Tim. Doug said, Reed sold out on it, talking about that play concussion protocol in a short week isn't good. Yeah, the fact that it's a short week is definitely uh, – um, the, the odds are stacked against you. Like I said, if he comes out today, though, and is limited, or tomorrow and is limited, I'm feeling a little bit better about it. Uh, safety first, though, man. That whole CTE yeah. and concussion thing ain't nothing to play with, man. It's yeah. Really a lot of lives. It's, Jaden Reed is not a big dude, you know, but we can <laughs> see. Plays he's like got, it, though, don't he? <laughs> he's got the heart of a of a lion. He's, um, But, yeah, I mean, we got it. I don't know, man. Mm -hmm. I love it in him, but, like, that is not the guy we want to use as a battering ram in short yardage situations. <laughs> I'm all for the flyer, you know, coming around the edge or a little jet motion here and there, get them, get them in space, get, get, get guys to hit their blockers. But the, the lower the boom and going in that, you know, he's a young guy, you know, he's got a bright future ahead of him. Right. And, um, you know, we're, we are asking a lot of him right now. And right. Um, it's understandable. You know, we're down Aaron Jones, we're down Christian Watson, you know, we, we need those spark. We're down Tay Wicks now. So we need, uh, we need that spark. And um, I got to respect Jaden Reed for playing, playing grown man, big boy football all the time. You'll love it. But uh, hopefully he's, he's going to be healthy here going forward. It's cool to see him get noticed nationally now too. There's a lot of people talking about Jaden Reed. Um, just hearing the McAfee show talk about him. He's, he's going to be a dog, man. There's no doubt about it. He's uh, you can see it too. When I went back and looked at the 2021 tape, that's when a lot turned on for me. I was like, holy cow, this is before he ever played a game for the Packers. It's yep. like, wow, his 2021 tape is way different than 2022. Uh, you can see what they, they saw in him. So maybe kind of rethink my whole draft board process and including two year or one year removed of college tape. 
to make sure you don't miss on people like that in the future. But uh, Zane Strong in the chat said, what is Tampa good and bad at this season? I hope we attack their weakness. Um, we're going to get into it a little later in the week, Zane. Uh, what I typically like to do is study tendencies and then bring you guys that information on the air. Um, I don't have that prep because we were going to talk about the PFF grades from the game uh, on Monday night, and then we'll kind of step into that. We're going to do chalk talk a little later, and then we'll have all the Tampa tendencies. But what I do have is the updated, since you brought it up, I've got the updated team statistics here, okay? So let's see where they fall in that regard and kind of show you uh, what their strength or weakness may be. Now, understand we don't have the entire list, but we may see them pop up here. Let's go to offense points per game, okay? This is basically how many points each offense is averaging per game. So let's look for Tampa on this list. The idea was to highlight Green Bay here, but if Tampa does show up on the list, if they don't show up on the list, then we could say, okay, they're probably not not very effective, right? I'm going to drop your comment down real quick. So Tampa Bay, 22nd in points per game. Now, immediately people go, wow, that's low. Yeah, but look at the last three. The second column in the last three games, they're up to 23.3. So if you were to take their last three and throw it into the first column, where would they rank? So NFL-wise, in the last three games, they're pretty much playing as a top 10 defense overall on the year, okay? So when you look at the average throughout the year, though, points per game, they're 22nd. So they're turning it on of late. It's starting to click. Their last game, they scored 29 points. Um, at home, they're averaging 16.3 uh, points scored. On the road, they're 23.4. So they actually score more points on the road. We all know it's going to be at Lambeau. So um, just something to keep an eye on. Now, where Green Bay ranks, they're actually tied for 17th at 21.5 points. I know some people have convinced themselves now that this, this offense is firing on all cylinders and they're absolutely excellent. Um, the numbers don't suggest that, although in the last three, they're averaging 26 points per game. So if you take that in here of recently, um, that would make them the eighth best or seventh best. Uh, yeah, eighth best offense as far as points per game in the last three games. So here lately, they're turning it on. Let's hope they can continue that because that's, that's definitely what they need, especially when the defense um, hits their snags. You know, the defense has been the bright point all year long. I know people don't want to hear it, but when you look at the points per game, the points per play, they're what's keeping you in ball games. Yep. This last game, obviously, that last drive was hard to watch. It was. Um, so you're only as good as your last game. We talk about it all the time, Tim. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, price line. Ah, mmm. The first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive, sought after, rare, and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to Caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at Caskers.com. It's what people are going to remember the most for sure. Uh, when you go to points per play, let's do this. Now, for whatever reason, there was an ad that kept popping on the right, so I couldn't have the entire column and show you guys home and away, but we got kind of the gist of it here. Um, in points per play, which I feel like is a more important metric to really judge an offense off of than points per game because it removes a little bit of the noise in the in the filtering of that stat. Green Bay is 14th, Tampa is 19th, okay? So now when you look at the second column, the last three games, .387, that would actually put them in the number eight spot in the last three games if you were to put it in that column of the entire season. So um, I know none of this stuff is compared in a vacuum. I got you. I understand that, that mindset, but that's kind of their offensive point. I think I feel real comfortable saying, Tim, they're right around a top 20 offense, right? Right around the 20 spot. Anything you want to hit on there, man? Um. I mean, just to kind of back up your point there, you know, the reason I think the one of the big reasons that we lost uh, to the Giants, what, like you said, was the defense uh, had a bad day. And um, I think if you look at our track record, I think offensively we didn't look great either. But, right. you know, right. the, the way our de defense typically plays, if we got a game like that out of them guys, this this might have been a, you know, a tw tw 20, 22 to 17 type affair, 22 to 14 type affair. Um, if our defense uh, plays a little bit better. And of course we don't have the, 
the miscues with the turnovers that led to uh, to points as well. Um, so with Tampa Bay coming up up to uh, Green Bay here, um, you know we gotta we gotta take that into consideration. If our defense plays well, um, we should win this game. You know, so we we've got to account for uh, Tampa Bay. They've got weapons. Um, I'm pretty sure Baker Mayfield's healthy uh, and will be playing. As far as I understand, if that's true or not, I don't follow the Buccaneers too much, but I do know that if that's true, that, uh, you know, Baker Mayfield is, you can say a lot of things about him, but uh, he's got that dog in him too. And that guy will uh, run through a wall for his team. Um, a lot like your boy, Will Levis is doing as well. He's kind of uh, that type of a, uh, of a quarterback and a leader. You know, if you think you're going to get pressure to Baker Mayfield and, and rattle him, that's not going to happen. He, he can be one of those guys that actually plays better. Um, if you're getting after him. So uh, I think defensively we got to be on our toes. And if we execute better offensively, we should be okay. But um, you know, Tampa Bay is a better team than, than the giants that we just lost to. So yeah. uh, of course, oh, yeah. Mayfield, no about Baker Mayfield's no, uh, no cutlet or anything like that, but um, yeah, you know, forget about it, you know, <laughs> but uh, Hey, we, we gotta, you know, you don't want to fear your opponent. You want to respect your opponent. You know, nobody's afraid of Tampa Bay. Um, but we cannot afford to do what we did on Monday and take anything for granted and think yep. we can just, you know, walk out with a dub. So, um, you know, it's an important game here Sunday. We'll see, um, <clears throat> how this defense responds after, uh, probably one of their worst performances of the season. So hopefully a get right game here, bounce back game. Yeah. We got made fun of for calling it a trap game. LaFleur, yeah. people rolled their eyes when LaFleur said the reality is we're a 6-16 six and 16 because they were on a heater. Um, you've seen it. It happens, man. It happens every week, any given Sunday. Man. This league will Sunday. humble you quick. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Jim in the chat said defense failed, and then he said defense was disgraceful. <laughs> so appreciate the, uh, the uh, comment there, Jim. Nick points out something very important. Didn't the offense turn the ball over two to three times? What's getting lost in the shuffle of everything um, is, yes, we turned the ball over twice there. Seven of those points. Keep in mind, we held the New York Giants to seven points in the first half. People forget that. So what happened? What went wrong, Clayton? Um, turnovers. Yeah. You the, you know, the Keyshawn Nixon muff punt, right, that led to another seven points, put the ball right down there. And, again, those type of stats are why people don't like points per game. Completely understand. Same, but on the defensive side, it actually tells you when stuff like that happens, your points per game is going to inflate, which means you're probably a little better because it's not taking into account those situations, right? If you were to remove that noise, it'd be even better. That's why I like points per play allowed as well. We're going to hit on that next. But, yeah, in that specific situation, not only did Keyshawn Nixon turn it over, gave them an extremely short field, they took it right in for a touchdown, which will make the numbers look crazy skewed, but also – People forget it was a three and out right before it when you forced the punt. So you came out, forced the three and out. And I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, let me look at the time stamp here because I know I've got it. Um, the muff punt, muff punt. I know I've got It's going to be on Chalk Talk for sure. Yeah, the muff punt. So it came. Guess when it came, Tim? It came during the middle eight. I was just going to say, quarter. was it middle eight? Yeah. We came out in the third quarter and got a – a three and out on them. Uh, Kenny Clark got a run stuff, right, um, on on third and one. So the defense came out in the third quarter during the middle eight, the most crucial time. For those of you who don't know, the middle eights, the last four minutes of the first half, the first four minutes of the second half, you take those numbers and you put them in a category with the turnover differential. Typically the team that wins both of those will win the game. It's something like it's in the 90s, the 90 percentile, right? So you come out in the second half, Joe Barry just held them to seven points in the first half, he and his defense. They come out and immediately in the third quarter get a three and out stop. Keyshawn Nixon muffs the uh, muffs the fumble, uh, muffs the punt. They take it right in for seven points, and then the floodgates open. So they won the middle eight and the turnover differential. They won the turnover differential by one point. They won both of those key statistics, the middle eight and the turnover differential, on one play. That muff punt, if if you want to put anything, this isn't a shot at Keyshawn. 
All these people that are trying to say it's Joe Barry's fault, it's Matt LaFleur's fault because he called too many reverses, it's Jordan Love's fault because he didn't protect the football. This, there's plenty of blame to go around. But I'm telling you right now, from an analytics standpoint, from a Vegas odds standpoint, that muff punt, it completely determined the outcome of the game. And you were still in the game down the stretch. I understand it's hard to watch the defense get dog walked down the field, but it's going to happen when you play man coverage. And it's now been confirmed by Matt LaFleur they were playing man coverage. And we covered it yesterday. We're going to hit on it again. We played the video where I think Matt LaFleur, what he's saying in that, and I asked the Packers fans, what do you think he's saying? Um, I think what he's saying there, and people are overlooking it because they hate Joe Barry. He's saying, yeah, the players can't line up that far off. Now, immediately you go, well, that's the defensive coordinator's fault. We've heard over and over and over, Matt LaFleur has said it from his mouth, we give our defensive players freedom to line up where they want to line up. So, well, then that needs to change. Then, yeah, then, it does. then, then be a leader and start Should have never, been a, thing. Should have yeah, never yeah. been a thing, man. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. As it, have, have we not realized the experiment isn't working? All right. You know, it's, it's different when you've got, uh, you know, Jair and Rasul running around back there and you're giving guys like that, yeah. you know, some freedom. Um, but when you've got, you know, first year players, yeah, not a good, not a good look, especially in a man set. So now you're in man <laughs> and then you're going to tell them they can line up wherever they want. Recipe for disaster. Yeah, it really is, man. And and that's what's crazy, too, is like, you know, the, the whole prevent defense talk was just, oh, my God. I had Carly hit me up. She was sending me screenshots of the comment section of other live streams where people were going, we were playing prevent. Well, you can play prevent, and man. Of course you can. Pre you know man prevent is three deep with man under. We were playing single high, <laughs> single high cover with man. People don't want to take the time to actually watch the tape, study, and understand Okay, we're playing cover one man in the corner. The corner on that upside is just playing 10 yards off the ball. By the way, who was it? Remember the video we showed just a second ago, the touchdown pass? Yep. A seventh round rookie because we wanted to get a third round pick out of Russell Douglas. And, right. and I just don't get, I mean, let's say we don't play off and we press up and we get roasted over the top anyway. What, so what are, what are we going to say then? Right. And that's the thing, too. Like for the people who were upset that they were playing soft on that drive, they, they refuse to acknowledge the fact that the 32-yarder, the gash, right, that put them in field goal range, we were playing three yards off the receiver in man coverage. Yep. Like the, the bend but don't break was working to that point. You were, at that point, you got to know as the Packers defensive coordinator, the clock is now the opponent. We need that clock to run out on them before they get within field goal range. And if they do get within field goal range, let's make them try a 55-yarder or a 60-yarder. Instead – Keyshawn got caught. This is Matt LaFleur's words, not mine, peeking into the backfield, playing man coverage. you got to keep your eyes on your work. What he's saying there is when you're in man coverage, you can't look at anything else. You're reading body language. You're reading tendencies. Keyshawn, the last game, Tim, talked about they've been studying tendencies of the quarterback and the receivers, right? He got caught peeking. Now, listen, Keyshawn owned it. He said, man, look, I played like crap. Like, this is on me. He's right, but – you win and you lose as a team. There's other opportunities in that game. Andres Carlson could have hit the field goal, right? Although he went three for four, so I'm not going to sit here and dog him. Uh, Jordan Love could have protected the ball and not turned it over twice. Although, you know, he's trying to fight for an extra yard to get a first down on a read option. He's getting hit by three defenders. It's hard to sit here and go, what's he thinking, right? It's uh, I'm not going to be the podcast that tries to throw one guy under the bus. I'm not going to do it. And to just sit here and pretend like it's – it's all Matt LaFleur's fault. It's all Jordan Love's fault. It's all Joe Barry's fault. It's all Keyshawn Nixon's fault. It's just – it's silly. I don't I don't want to – It's a team loss. Yeah. Rooter to the tutor, top yeah. to bottom. Everybody – everybody failed in this game. You know, right. it is what it is. Like, there, there's plenty of mistakes to go around, you know. Absolutely. Completely agree, man. Um, all right, so we hit on that. Let's hit on defense since we were talking about defense, right? Um, let's go to points per play or points per game for defense, okay? And, again, the ab was up, so I couldn't hit. I'd love to be able to see their home and away, what they do at home and away, because I think it's important for key matchups. Let me drop this comment down. Again, Nick, thank you for the comment, buddy. Um, so points per game defense-wise, um, Green Bay is currently sitting 11th. Tampa is sitting 13th. So Green Bay has now dropped to 11th. We talked about that muff punt. That led to seven points. That obviously hurts it. Um, when you look at the last three games now, with Green Bay in the 11th place at 20.5, and the last three games are giving up 21.7. So if you look over to the left-hand column, that would drop you out of the top 20. 
So in the last three games, you're starting to see the defense start to struggle a touch, right? That's what you're seeing. Now, of course, this last game, it was 24 points. That was kind of the big outlier because they held Patrick Mahomes to, I think, uh, right around 20 points, under 20 points, 19, right? Um, and obviously in Detroit, they got a little bit of a mop up there when we went uh, more of a prevent defense down the stretch up by 14 points. And, you know, they got that that garbage time touchdown as well. So all those things, uh, they're I think they're important to me to put everything into context, but for some, they don't want to acknowledge it. That's totally cool. You can fan how you want to fan. Uh, points per game right now, Green Bay is currently 11th. Points per play, Green Bay is 10th at .31. Tampa is 12th. So you see these defenses are very, very similar in points per game, points per play, Tim. Um, offense, Green Bay's got the better offense than Tampa. This has the makings of uh, another one-score game. Yep. It's either by one, two, or three points, right? Luckily, we're in Lambeau. Hopefully, we'll get a little bit of home field advantage there. Not talking ref-wise, just the boys being comfortable, sleeping in their own bed, all that stuff. But uh, anything you want to hit on defense-wise here is Green Bay is is still right there. Yeah, I know people hate to see it, but they're still in the top ten in scoring defense, and they, they are losing their mind because they just want every negative metric they can point to to blame the defense for what's going on. But turnover differential is what wins you ball games. Turnover differential, middle eight, situational football making the mistakes at the big times. And uh, that's what happened on Sunday or on Monday. That's what I see anyway. But yeah. what do you think, Tim? Um, I think we're going to have a, another close game, like you said. And I, I think this defense is going to bounce back and they're going to get after it. Um, you know, they we're, we're probably in the minority of the opinion, but our defense has been pretty good this year. Pretty, pretty, pretty good pretty this good. year. Um, so uh, good defenses when they have a uh, – a crap performance like they did uh, on Monday, they usually bounce back. And uh, I fully anticipate this D stepping up almost like uh, taking that approach. We've been taking offensively, you know, offensively, we've been saying, Hey, give us the ball, uh, play action, bomb, start the game, whatever, you know, end around jet, jet sweep, start the game, whatever. Let's, let's get rolling. I think we're going to see that with our defense against Tampa Bay. I think we're going to see aggressive uh, defense and, um, you know, hopefully a lot of three and outs, hopefully some takeaways and hopefully our offense, um, you know, protects the football and uh, moves the sticks. You know, we can't have drives stalling out. That's the worst thing is when you put a drive together and then you get nothing, you know, or you're or you're, you're kicking three three pointers all day. Um, you know, we talk about the kicker and all of this. It's like, you know, if you're worrying about one field goal in your game, chances are you made a made some other mistakes that got you in that position. And here's the thing, too. And, Jim, I think this is who Jim's talking about. If it isn't, I apologize. You guys correct me. He said all that matters is his performance, and it hasn't been very reliable. He's talking about Anders Carlson, the kicker, I assume, right? What's getting lost in the shuffle, too, and this is why we do chalk talk and the game flow aspect. You see, oh, he missed a field goal. He didn't hit all four of his field goals as a rookie, right? It's on him. Did you see the play before? We lost 10 yards on a sack. Yep. We took a sack and made a chip shot field goal more difficult. Those things matter. They matter. So uh, it's funny that, you know, four weeks ago it was get rid of love. Love isn't the guy, right? Then we go through the spell where he plays hot and, and again, his last four games, nine touchdowns, one interception, I think. And it's now love can't be blamed for anything. It drives me insane. Like yeah, if, if one extreme it, to the next. Yeah. If you see it, you got to say it. If it happened in the game, do the research, find the key important plays in the specific situations. This is what I'm talking about here in these specific situations and how you get a run stuff coming out in the middle eight. You're, you're about to seal up the middle eight, right? And instead, you turn the ball over, you lose the turnover differential and the middle eight on one muff pump, one specific play. If you dis if you refuse to acknowledge that and gloss over that stuff, then you're given an inaccurate depiction of what actually happened in the game. And if that's what people want to do, hey, have at it. Fan the way you want to fan. But they're not going to jump in my mentions and be like, oh, you're making excuses. I'm making excuses by showing you more information, like showing you exactly what happened play for play. Like that's 2023. Which is so something that these, these people won't do. They won't chart a game. And we're not talking about Jim. We're talking about other people. Other people right. No, no. We're, yeah, we're talking about the that that whole narrative, right? Uh, that whole demographic of fan out there, you know, right. and uh, and that's not a, a knock, you know, like we always say fan how you want to fan there, you know, like right, some yeah. people don't want to fan that way. They don't want to get into every play and 
just you don't know, we know the advantages that it brings when you chart a game it puts you <clears throat> in this in the game more you're paying more attention you realize just how fast a football game goes you know most right. people watch football and they think oh a game takes all day it's you know three hours or watching football it's like man that game is an hour <laughs> <laughs> the and game a, is one hour of football and you know two and a half hours of you know bud light commercials so you know what are you going to do <laughs> when you chart a game man you really you really do it gets you into the every moment you understand what's going on and yeah you know we're not doing our rookie kicker any favors here um in a lot of these situations um and yeah you expect a, a any kicker that you know pressure or not you know you got one job put the ball through the uprights i understand that yeah. Um, and there's a lot more than just foot on the football when you're kicking. There's a snap, there's a hold, there's a rush. There, you know, there's a lot of variables. Um, anything can go wrong on a on a 25 yard field goal, let alone a 45 or 50, 55 plus uh field goal. And again, kicking on turf outside, that's that's another variable. Like I said, the only thing worse than turf is turf outdoors. I'll never understand it. It's like kicking it on wet turf. carpeting. But um you know, hey, this this kid's gonna turn it around. Um, he's building his uh, his repertoire as a uh, as a pro right now, and um, I think he's just gonna get better with time. We got to be patient. We have to be patient. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, Jim, you said all that matters is performance, and it's been uh, very unreliable in a in a situation like that where you end up losing. You know, if he hits that fourth field goal and he goes a hundred percent on the day, yeah, you win the game. Um, I completely understand that, man. I really do. It's a, it's a tough look, right? It's tough to swallow. But when you look at the kicking statistics, now you guys correct me if I'm wrong, if you find that these numbers are inaccurate. Because this website I found, yeah, I was like, this looks like as ghetto as it gets. But I couldn't find the kicking statistics that would sort correctly on any other site. So I think these are accurate, okay? They should be up to date to the best of my knowledge. Um, if, it, if they are – then currently Andres Carlson is sitting 11th in the league in kick and field goal percentage. Okay. I tried to sort it for extra point two to kind of get an idea of where he ranks there. Unfortunately, the site kept locking up when I tried to do that. So field goal percentage, he's 11th at 80%. He's hitting 80% of his field goals. According to this, Tim, um, as a rookie kicker, I am, I am happy with that. Like, you're talking about a top 10 kicker in accuracy, a borderline top 10 kicker in accuracy. Cause I think, um, yeah, 10th, he's actually tied for 10th. I apologize. He's 11th on this list. He's tied for 10th. And it looks like Randy Bullock's only attempted five kicks, if I'm looking at that correctly. So much yep. your sample size for Anders Carlson. So you could say he's legit a top 10 accurate kicker. Now, when you look at the extra point percentage, I think that's something that's kind of stood out. He's missed a few extra points. He's still at 88.9% on extra point percentage. I believe that's the number over there that we're looking at. So I couldn't sort by it, but just wanted to give an update on Anders because it got talked yep. about by Matt LaFleur too. Um, he said, when asked Bill Huber on Twitter says, they asked uh, Matt LaFleur, um, are you committed to uh, Anders Carlson? I'll just read the tweet. Bill Huber tweeted out, LaFleur is quote, absolutely committed to Carlson for the rest of the season. If there was any doubt, they asked him, he said, are you committed to keeping him as your kicker? He said, absolutely. <laughs> So if I'm sure any, Matt's looking up going, he's hitting 80% of his damn kick. Yeah. Like if there's any about? doubt, you're you're doing you're you're doing this wrong, guys. You know, like there I don't know. Can we get those numbers back up on the screen real quick? Yeah, absolutely. I, I saw something that so a couple names on here, some other younger uh kickers, um, Atlanta, uh Mr. Koo in Atlanta, yeah. uh, a guy who had a rookie season, if if memory serves me correct, uh pretty similar to the type of rookie season Anders Carlson is having. And, um, you know, Koo is certainly one of the top kickers in the, in the league now. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of guys that, you know, I, I don't know if this is a Packer fan thing, if this is something that we do, or if a lot of teams do this, they're fans, but you know, you, we expect people to come in and just be phenomenal right away. We expect them to be perfect every Sunday, every game. And we, we gloss over we, the fact that, you know, this is a learning process and playing football in college and playing football in the NFL are, are very different. And so is kicking a football in college versus kicking in the NFL. Um, you know, we have to be uh, aware of the fact that this is a rookie. Now, if, if, you know, Anders was in year five or six or something. Okay. Now, now we might want to have a conversation about the, some of the inconsistencies, but, He's a rookie, guys. You know, we gotta we gotta be patient. Yeah. 
Definitely. Chiefs head Murphy in the chat said Crosby got picked and let go in the same week. What does that say? We were talking about that offline, Murph. It's uh yep. Crosby got added to uh to the roster out there in LA. Like Tim said, a lot of fire under their kicker, and then boom, he's gone again, right? I think it says that Goop made the right decision, right? You guys know I've been critical of Goop. I, okay. I, I have never been accused of being a goot licker. Um, I've been one on the other side that they think that I'm a I'm calling people goot licker. That's not what I'm doing either. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure if we had Mace still here kicking, you know, uh, what 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 would people be? What would the argument be if he's not doing well? Oh yeah, you know what? It'd be. Then we're gonna hear. Well, we should have moved on. And yeah. what if they kick, draft a kid, Andres Carlson? They should have kept that kid. So it's like <laughs> I. It's, you, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> you know, guys, it's it's his rookie year. Um, to be honest with you, I thought he was going to be worse. You know, coming coming out of camp, we were really nervous, dude. I thought it was going to be like, oh, he's going to be down there around fifty percent. Like, yeah. And when I look at these numbers, it's like, what else you could know, you ask for, man? It's a rookie. Yeah, we, I mean, we've got to get to the PFF grades because I put that in the title, and I'm tired of putting something in the title and us getting off on tangents. But this is this is important, though, Tim. These kicker kicking numbers, man, it's so important. Number one Packer fan yep. said it's only four games left in the season. Why would anyone ask him that question? Of course, he's going to stick. <laughs> you know why, buddy? You know why? Because, oh man, because they uh, they try to corner him, man. They uh <laughs> they do what they can to try to get and, and hey one more Mason thing here's the other thing are we are we sending Mason Crosby onto the field for anything longer than no 45 no. 40 48 47 probably 50 I would think is probably the the peak and that and we're gonna be saying a prayer before every kick with him at 50 plus but Anders Anders can put that thing a couple rows up in the stadium if he you need sure to. Can. And let me tell you, when Anders tweaks that accuracy and, and, and gets that leg under him how how he needs to, and mm -hmm. he's hitting with accuracy from that range, we'll we'll see what the narrative is about our kicker here in the next few seasons. I think, you know, for everyone who says he's going to miss a kick, cost us the game, I think there's going to be one down the stretch here that he booms and we go, look at this. I think, I think it could happen. I That's expect cool. rookie kickers to miss kicks, guys. Like, Again, it's like going into the season, me saying we're going to win six to ten games. Um, that's not to brag and go, ha-ha, I called it. No, it's like like try to try to really sit down and look at the team and look at the kicker and, okay, what have rookies done in the past and this and that? What have kickers done in the past? And create a real a realistic kind of prediction or expectation, I should say, man. But Nathan in the chat, appreciate you. Nathaniel Schneider says, Crosby was 81% career. Longwell was 83%. Carson Carlson is at 80% on the year. He's doing fine. Thank you for pulling those numbers, Nathaniel, because it is so important to compare yep. players to what people have done in the past. You know, sometimes it, you can look at the current year and think, okay, that's a tell-all end all. It's important to kind of look at it over. Uh, so essentially, Tim, if Carlson is over 80%, I think he's the kicker moving forward. I feel he's right on pace. It's so funny because we always talk about the quarterbacks in Green Bay. It's like, man, we've had some kickers. You know, I'm I grew up on Chris Jackie, man, watching that guy kick kick the ball was was phenomenal. And yeah. I mean, we've had some legends here, man. Mace and, and Ryan Longwell. You know, this is good company uh, to see Anders Carlson in here, and I, I fully expect the uh, the field goal percentage to increase here over the over the next few years. Yeah, definitely. That I, I, I'm telling you right now, I did not have kicker on my bingo card today for what we were doing <laughs> this long. It's hilarious because the chat loves it. Um, Jennifer, I'll hit a couple more here. Jennifer says, take off um, dome kickers. Betty's even higher. Think about that, too. Some of those kickers, like Dallas's kicker, 100%. Look, he's kicking down there in Jerry World. Yep. Uh, you know, Gary's – or. Uh, Jerry Jones that are bringing him a, a margarita, let him get a sip of a Bloody Mary before he goes out there in his nice climate control kicking situation. Anders out there kicking in a swirling winds, a Lambo, and then obviously Giant Stadium is one of the toughest places to kick field goals from what I've heard. So uh, MetLife Stadium, I should say. I apologize. Dakota, last comment here, and then we'll go to the PFF grades real quick as we wrap up. Dakota says, I can't wait until Anders kicks a game-winning field goal. It'll happen in the playoffs. I'm calling it, dude. If he kicks a game-winner, in the wild card round of the playoffs, if we make it to the playoffs, we all understand. Some people are listening going, wow, y'all think y'all are slammed up. No, nobody's saying that. But if we make it to the playoffs and he kicks a game winner in the wild card, mark my words, I will buy an Anders Carlson jersey. If they don't <laughs> exist, I will have one custom made to wear on this show right here. 
and it'll who knows he may be gone in two years and I regret it, but I will do it, Tim. I will do it. Um, all right, let's do this PFF grades, man. We got to hit on them. We should have hit on them yesterday. I apologize, but I get to talking with you guys in the chat and uh, get sidetracked here. Offensive grades from the Giants game. I'll just go from top to bottom here. There's no real uh, – nobody that you can really pull out here because they had a limited amount of snaps. Everybody towards the top, everybody pretty much on the list had a significant amount of snaps, so we'll just rattle them off. Number one, Patrick Taylor, 77.9, had 32 snaps. Tucker Craft, 76.4. Tim, that's what we've been looking for, bro. He played 68 snaps and graded out a 76.4, not just that. In the passing game, 72.0. In the run block or the pass blocking, 74.1. Run blocking, 70.5. Tucker Crafts getting his feet under him. God, I hope this is normal. I hope this is the new norm. It's why you take multiple swings on positions of need in the draft because if you miss on one, you hit on another. I think they hit on both. We got to get Musgrave healthy. You will never hear me moan and complain about 12 personnel again. If Tucker Craft is playing like this and Moose and, and Luke Musgrave shows what he's done early in the year, too. I'm so excited about Tucker Craft. I hope, I hope this is normal. Now, overall in the season, we're, we're gonna pull those up a little later in the week and kind of see how consistent players have been. But man, this what a game, what a coming out party for Tucker Craft. Zach Tom, 72.2, held his own over there against Thibodeau. Um, Rasheed Walker, left tackle, 67.7. A.J. Dillon, 66.1. Um, his uh, pass blocking grade really drug him down at a 43.0. Running grade was 64.7. Um, A.J. in the passing game, 72.5, though, man. Great catch and run. We'll talk about that maybe on uh, on the next episode. Samori Torre, 66.0, only 18 snaps. Dontavian Wick, 65.6. 43 snaps. Dontavian Wicks is just steady Eddie, man. Uh, John Runyon rebounded a little bit, 65.0. Jordan Love, you guys heard me say on the postgame show, I just pray to sweet baby Jesus he ain't in the red. He wasn't in the red, thank God. So he finished at 58.6, still a horrible game, obviously. You could see it all over the tape. He was inaccurate in the first half, turned the ball over twice. That's a grade he deserved, you know. <clears throat> and let's hope that this is a little valley and he's going to go right back to the peak again that we've seen the previous three games. Jaden Reed, even though he scored the tud, had a uh, had a little uh, a little bit of an off night, fifty six point six. So something to monitor there. Sean Ryan, fifty six point zero. Everybody was screaming for Sean Ryan. Again, you see it. Pass block eighty one point seven. Run block fifty four point eight. Yash Nyman, fifty five point nine. Malik Heath, fifty five point eight. Um, Got to get more consistent with Malik. But man, those two touchdown catches at the end were just phenomenal. I know one didn't count, but I'm still calling it a touchdown catch because it's just a great job improvising, getting open, strong hands. Although they batted it out after he took the third step, um, it's a tough call. I, 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 I don't get that. My buddy Tony was asking the same question. So if you're going to the sideline and you make a catch and you get two feet down and you maintain possession, that's a catch. Mm -hmm. Why is the rule different in the end zone? Right. I don't. I don't get it, man. I don't understand. Anyway, <laughs> topic for another day, Tim. I know. It, you know it's crazy, bro. Um, Josiah Aguara, 55.1. Romeo Dobbs, 54.7. Josh Myers, 54.6. Ben Sims, 52.4. Ben Sims only getting 10 snaps really says a lot about Tucker Craft, guys. Says a whole lot about Tucker Craft. Um, because, you know, going into this game, it's like, okay, maybe Ben Sims is more cut out than Tucker Craft right now. And, you know, no, Tucker Craft took a huge step forward. Josh Myers, though, 54.6. All those people that did their victory lap three weeks ago, oh, where are they at? I thought Josh Myers was horrible. Don't count your chickens before they hatch, man. 54.6, pass blocking grade, 30.0, run blocking grade, 61.4. The Jaden Reed run down the sideline, not the touchdown, but the other uh, the, the other of the 32 end of rounds that Matt LaFleur called, um, <laughs> he uh, had a nice play there. The only positive play that I've seen from Josh Myers on the day. I'm telling you, he was all over the tape just looking sloppy. Um Got to get center fixed, man. In, in the last two games, we were we were in here going, man, maybe he's turning the corner. Maybe this is it. Consistency, man, it's it's huge. So I'm eager to see how he grades out once all this falls into place. Anything you want to hit on there offensively? What sticks out to you, man? Um, yeah, Patrick Taylor, number one on the list. Um, thought we got a pretty good performance out of him. I had a question for you on the receivers, mm -hmm. like Toure and Reed, S R Y Y. Wide receiver is that slot? Are they saying slot receiver slash wide receiver? What does that, what does that designation mean? The what now for the position? You know when you're looking at receiver, 
Oh, yeah, it's just basically saying that's that's where they lined up the majority of the time. Slot, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah that's I slot. Yeah, I imagine that's what they did, slot there. And know. then the other one, right and left, wide out. Okay, it I see. It really that. gives you a good idea of, like, how the depth chart says. Like, Jaden Reed is your slot receiver. Samori Torre is kind of the backup slot. So when players go out, Jaden slides into the Z. Samori Torre will come in. Of course, Samori Torre actually replaced Jaden Reed. But I think they try to narrow that down to where they line up. Right, okay. right wide receiver, left wide receiver and then slot. Okay. Makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and then Zach Tom, of course, uh, stands out. Uh, you talk about steady Eddie. I mean, one one thing for sure we don't have to worry about on our offensive line, thank God. Um, and then, yeah, Tucker Craft, absolute dog. You got to love a tight end that just wants to go out and hit somebody, whether that's blocking, whether that's I have the ball and I'm going to lower the boom. I mean, I love it. Hard nose. Tight end. I love it. Yeah, definitely. Um, trying to keep up in the chat here. Let's jump over to the defense real quick, and then we'll uh, get ready to wrap this thing up. I got to get going for sure. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, you've got, uh, let's see, Devontae White, 89.7. Great game from White. Only 29 snaps. He got banged up there. I think about right around halftime it seemed like it was. I think it was pretty early in the game, if I remember correctly. Uh, TJ Slayton, 86.9 with 34 snaps. Guys doing their job in the middle, right? It's just, uh, you know, again, what did what did Tommy DeVito do all day long? Drop back, stepped up, and scrambled out through the the rush lane, right? Um, that would make you think, okay, how did the edge defenders do? I'm glad you asked. Preston Smith, sixty three point eight. Rashawn Gary, fifty eight point six. Who do you think PFF thinks it's their fault, <laughs> right? Kingsley yep. and Ivory had twenty snaps, forty point nine. But, again, back to the positive. Eric Wilson, you guys heard us talk about him. It's only one snap, 75.2. Um, but that dude, every time he's on the field, like he made a play on that fourth down stop. Um, he and McDuffie, he got in the backfield or he got to the line of scrimmage just enough to wrap the, the running back up. And then McDuffie came in and just, I mean, bulldozed him. Um, Eric Wilson, I think, is one of those players. He's an unsung hero on this team. And if he ever has to play in a pinch, I think I feel really comfortable with Eric Wilson being out there. Kobe Wooden, only seven snaps, but 73.3 for the rookie. Our boy Lucas Van Ness, only 14 snaps, but 72.1. Tim, I'm telling you, man, he's slowly, slowly coming along, dude. Um, I think he's going to be starting next year. I really do. Yeah. Isaiah McDuffie, we talk about how he's just one of those players. He's not going to make huge mistakes. He's just kind of steady Eddie as well. Uh, 40 snaps, 68.3 PFF grade, not bad for McDuffie. Carrington Valentine, 66.3. Tackling grade was good. Coverage grade was 69.0. Tackle was 77.8. Run fit, though, 53.1, not great. Like we said, Preston Smith, 63.8. Rudy Ford, 63.1. Kenny Clark, 62.3. Not a great game from Kenny. Um, not not horrible, but not great, obviously. Jonathan Owens, 62.2. Devondre Campbell, man, he just continues to struggle, 59.2. You've seen it all day long, too. Um, well, we just talked about on that play. We broke down to DeVito. It's like you wish he was a little more aggressive there. Those are the little things that you're going to get graded low on for sure. Rashawn Gary, 58.6. Darnell Savage, 57.9. Carl Brooks had a bad game, 24 snaps, 50.7. Corey Ballantyne, 46.1. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to read off Russell Douglas's PFF grade, but you can use your own imagination there, okay? Um, Kingsley and Ibarre, 20 snaps, 40.9. Keyshawn Nixon, we talked about it. I don't mean to pile on. He's the lowest graded player on defense in the slot corner position, 40.1. That doesn't even include his special teams grade. Um, that I'm sure was uh, fairly low, too, with the muff punt. But, Tim, what do you want to hit on right here, buddy? Uh, you know, my defense, um, yeah, they didn't have themselves a good game at all. <laughs> uh, Zay McDuffie, though, um, what's telling, too, is we talk about how good he is um, tackling and uh, his run run fits and things like that. But, you know, he graded at a 68-and-a-half on uh, coverage, which I, I think is pretty good for uh, – Isaiah McDuffie. So that shows a little bit more versatility in his game. Um, sticking with the linebackers with Dre, I think um, what you're seeing is a veteran player um, that uh, mentally has has the tools and, and the experience, but physically his body is probably limiting some of the movement that, uh, that he wants to make. And that might explain some of these um, plays where we don't see him being as aggressive as maybe we did last year. Or, or in previous years. Um, Dre has had multiple 
multiple nagging injuries that he's been dealing with. And none of these are excuses. This is just the reality. Fact, you know, yeah. If you're, if you're, if you have two bad ankles and you're trying to close out on a scrambling quarterback, I mean, come on guys, you know, you're going to be at a disadvantage. So um, I think that's what we're seeing with Dre, his play um, and execution on the field is really suffering due to the, I think the constraints on him physically. Um, and it says a lot that he's out there getting after it still. So um you know, being down Quay Walker doesn't help. It's, you know, everyone's got to step up and, uh, you know, sticking with the linebacker theme. I'd love to see Eric Wilson get more than one snap going forward. Um, if Quay's going to miss another week, not that it, that we know that that's going to happen, hopefully not, but um, we do. We need to start thinking about peppering in uh, Eric Wilson because he's kind of a spark plug uh, in the middle there for sure. Yeah, definitely. He's just one of those guys that's nice to have him on the, on the depth chart. We'll briefly hit on special teams because we're out of time here. Just real quick, if you guys would hit that like button for us so other Packer fans can find this content, find this channel. We appreciate y'all hanging out with us on this Wednesday morning for Good Morning Lambeau. Um, PFF grade-wise, Eric Wilson, 62.9, the second highest, only behind the long snapper. Eric Wilson played 22 special team snaps. Great job by Goody and the guys bringing him back and making sure he stays on this roster because he is. He's, he's playing a key role. He's one of the unsung heroes. There's no two ways about it. Now, when you look for Keyshawn Nixon, He's in the 14th spot at 60.5. If he hadn't had that muff punt, probably would have had a decent PFF grade. But, again, it was it – was I don't mean to pile on, but it was hands down the most important play of the day. Um, there's no no doubt about that. Yeah. So, um, we'll finish up in the chat here real quick. Tim, let me get your parting thoughts. Oh, um, I guess we'll talk about Keyshawn. Uh, that was uh, – you know, that, that muff punt was um, just a mental error is really what it was. It was – it was a – Thing that happens, right? I don't care who you are. You could be the best returner in the league. You're going to muff a punt probably at least once a year. We had, we had Reed, Jaden Reed bobbled one earlier this year and to his credit fell on top of it immediately. Uh, but um, I think, you know, with Keyshawn, just to defend the logic here, Keyshawn's a playmaker. Okay. That's the reason we like him. That's the reason he's made a name for himself here. And so when a playmaker thinks he has a chance to make a play, he's going to do that. And I, and the error was thinking that he had a chance to make a play there. <laughs> you know, when he fell on that ball, he should have just stayed on it, but he's thinking, man, I can get up and spin out and get another, trying to make you know, it I love him for that. I really do. But that cost us dearly. That, that was the mistake. And I'm sure if you asked him, he would tell you that, that, Hey, I was, I thought I he could actually, play. Yeah. You already know? has. Yeah. Yeah. So, Hey, it is what it is. Um, you know, next time I'm sure he doesn't, uh, you know, Carly Ray had, had talked about that in our chat. He's probably not going to make that mistake again. You know, there it is. He knows if, if that happens again, he falls on it. Um, but yeah, guys, I final thoughts. Um, get ready for Tampa. Get ready for another uh, nail biter. We're gonna get to the, bite them nails. Let them grow out until Sunday. So you got something to nibble on while you're watching this one. But I, know I got people. a feeling I, I'd love to see a boat race. I'd love to boat race them. But um, I don't know. Something tells me it's going to be a one-score game. I, I agree. And, and I know people, they get uncomfortable talking about that. I love it. I love close games, dude. I'm that dude on the edge of my seat. Like, th this is what – listen, it, it's great to see your team blow another team out. And, and obviously, any fan would want to see that over a, a tight game. But there's just something about those close games where, you know, the game hinges on every single play, like the Keyshawn Nixon, you know, yeah. play. I'm just hoping we can get one of those, Clayton. Like, just once can we boat race a team and just – Right, yeah, yeah. Please? Well, that's the thing, man. Like, in Green Bay, it's it's been – you know, we have boat race teams in the past, you know, under McCarthy and other – you know, and obviously LaFleur when he got here early. But for the most part, it's very rare you see the Packers lose by more than two scores. Like, you're in every game. And as a fan, I know this is going to tick some people off, but as a fan, that's that's all I can ask for is to have meaningful football every single Sunday for yeah. decades. Like, it's hard for yeah. me to complain, you know. I just want to be in it. I want to be in it and have a shot. I couldn't imagine being a fan of, of you know, teams like Carolina right now. It's just like, oh, my God. Because we were looking at that this year. People thought, hey, there's a chance that could be us. We don't know how this young team's going to perform. Um, but Ron in the chat says, I've been a Packers fan for 50 years. Hey, we appreciate that, Ron. Thank you for holding that flag up, man. And if you think moving on from players and not having patience like most teams, we will become a team like the Bad News Bears. It's a fact, man. If uh, if some of the fan base got what they wanted, we would be right down there with them because we would have pulled the plug on everybody. Early. Jordan Love would be gone. Matt yep. would be gone. 
Brian Gudikas would be gone. All them, all down the line. And we um, never hear a, a realistic suggestion for a replacement or a or a plan. We just hear complaining, moaning, and fire fire this pe- these people. And we never hear a proposed solution. So I yeah. I don't get it. Yeah, me neither, man. Me neither. All right, let's see here. Sound like Jim's in here upsetting everybody, but let's just keep, <laughs> let's keep it clean in the chat, guys, please. For God's sakes, let's uh, let's talking go. about kicking. <laughs> Can't we all just get along? Uh, Jennifer right in the chat says Myers had Lawrence all day. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't look up each time and go, yep, he's he's got Lawrence here. Um, talking about Dexter Lawrence. If that's the case, Jennifer, that's a great um, that's a great observation, and we need to take that into consideration. Dexter Lawrence is one of the best in the game. So thank you for pointing that out. And uh, we'll get the monitor moving forward, right? When we play Tampa, we'll see if he bounces back because he was playing better going into this game. But I'm just saying those people that were running those victory laps, man, they are nowhere to be found right now. Uh, Doug in the chat says, secondary tackling grade, just miserable. You see it over and over and over. That's one thing, you know, some people were screaming, uh, what about Al Harris, bring Al Harris in from Dallas? Listen, uh, you guys know how I stand on Joe Barry. Never have you heard me say he's a great co- uh, great coordinator. I'm simply showing you what's happening on tape. You're seeing blown coverages. You're seeing missed tackles. Uh, you're seeing the head coach going, I don't know why the defender is playing off the line that far. Um, if you want to blame Joe Barry, that's cool. But one thing about the Dallas Cowboys defense, their tackle grade is excellent. Now, Al Harris has never called a defensive series in his entire life at the NFL level. Being a coordinator and a position coach is two totally different things, but you got you also got to understand me. I've got to sit back and go, okay, every defensive coordinator was not a defensive coordinator at one time. So got to take that into consideration too. We'll see though. Um, Derek K in the chat said Dre needs to sit, maybe even shut it down for the year. Um, something's off, man. I don't I refuse to believe that this is the new norm for him. Um, I think it does have to do with the injuries and stuff like that, but that play where he was in position to pick that ball off on the sideline, he just kind of completely whiffed. That was a tough missed, play. Missed tackle in the run fit too. You know, yeah. hits his hits his run fit and just can't can't wrap up. You know, yeah. There could be a number of issues that we don't even know about either. Like we know about the ankles, right? And we yeah. know I think he had something with the neck or something. Um, so we know about those, but w- what you never hear about is like is his back sore. You know what I mean? Does he have there's other nagging things that, and again, these are not excuses. It's just the reality of being a football player in the, in the NFL. I mean, you're, you're running yourself violently into people on a week to week basis, uh, nearly a daily basis, depending on what, what your practices are looking like. So, um, you know, it wears on you and, uh, Dre is, uh, he's not an old dog yet, but he's certainly not a, not a spring chicken anymore either. So, um, yeah, I don't know. He's a veteran leader, though, on this defense, like you said, Clayton. And, um, you know, we got to roll with him and give him the benefit of the doubt here. But uh, I don't know if I'd go out on that limb and say outright sit him. But uh, I certainly think maybe looking at that rotation in the middle, maybe, you know, peppering in some more Mr. Wilson. I don't know. It all depends, too, on if we get Quay back. You know, that that can change things, too, back there. So, yeah, it could. It really could. We'll see how it unfolds. So, again, guys, um, as far as tonight's show, um, as of right now, I'm not planning on doing one simply because I had a, uh, a vet appointment for the pups. We were supposed to take them in at 12 o'clock today, which is a couple hours from now. They had to push it back to four. So it's going to be hard for me to get back home, get the show set up. Um, all I'll say is check back on YouTube on our homepage, say around five o'clock central, six o'clock central. And, uh, if I don't have one up by then, then you'll know there's probably not a show. Okay. So that's one way to kind of keep your, uh, keep your eye on whether or not we're going to go live. I would love to do one. I'm hoping I can, but as it sits right now, I don't want to tell you guys, yeah, I'm going to do one, set the stream up and then me not come through. I definitely don't want you guys setting time aside to hop in here and talk ball and me not follow through. So um, right now, no show tonight, but I will let you guys know if that changes. Tim, I'll definitely let you know in case you're free too, buddy. So. Okay. For sure. Get them pups taken care of. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. We're going for their final shots, and then uh, I'm going to Florida next week. The plan is to do a show on site in Florida, so I've got some tech that we ordered and uh, going to take with me, so hopefully we can make it happen. But we got to get those final shots so we can kennel them up while we're out of town. So that's the whole purpose, so I, I can't get out of the vet appointment today. So with that being said, guys, appreciate you all hanging out with us. Everybody in the chat, you were absolutely awesome. 
Um, for those of you listening on the pod, thank you for making us a part of your day. This has been Good Morning Lambo. Y'all have a great day. Keep it positive. Like I said, take care of one another. Let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. And go Pack Go. Go.